Welcome to Building Belonging, a podcast of the New York City Bar Association and its Office for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. In this episode, empowering communities with affinity groups. Tanya, Angie, and Mary Ellen speak with Zila Acosta Grimes, associate at Debevoise and Plimpton. Zila's roots in New York's Latinx community and legal community run deep. She shares her own immersive upbringing in those communities and shares her playbook for building affinity groups that make inclusive and powerful spaces for communities not traditionally represented in the law. When you get a group of people who all have similar experiences and you're all standing together, suddenly this is an issue that needs to be addressed and not just dismissed. That kind of power and community is what affinity groups are naturally built for. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. Here's your host, Tanya martinez Galanucci. Welcome back to Building Belonging. Building belonging through affinity groups, a topic near and dear to my heart because I am also a builder of affinity groups. And I'm so glad that we have the expert um, on doing this here with us today, Zila. And so we're going to jump right in because I really want us to get into this conversation. My name is Tanya Martinez Galanucci. I am the executive director of the Office for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. I'm handing it off to Angie. Thank you, Tanya. Hi, my name's Angie Avila. I am the manager of communications and development with the office. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Mary Ellen. Thank you. And I'm Mary Ellen LaRosa, and I'm the coordinator for the office. And now we're going to hand it over to Zila, if you could just introduce yourself and talk a bit about what belonging means to you. Thank you all for having me. My name is Zila Costa Grimes. I'm an associate at Double Voice in Plumpton. Belonging has meant a lot of different things to me in a lot of different contexts, but overall, it just means the ability to be myself in a space and to have the space to be myself. It doesn't mean that that always needs to be comfortable. It doesn't mean that it can't be challenging to be myself or that there isn't any opposition. But I need to have the space and have the ability to carve out a space to be myself. And so for me, that is what has led to me in many different contexts to feel like I belong somewhere, to feel like an environment is welcoming and I can be myself. And so overall, I think as we'll talk about today, I think affinity groups can contribute a lot to that and that they allow you to create a space where you can belong and be yourself. So that's kind of what belonging means to me. So I just want to jump right in and ask you a little bit more about your background and where you grew up. I know previously when we talked, we discussed you growing up in New York City, more specifically in Inwood. So if you could give us some deeper perspective on what that was like. Absolutely. So I grew up, my mother is Puerto Rican, my dad is Dominican, they met in New York, which is probably the most New York story you've ever heard, you know, Dominicans and Puerto Ricans meeting in this wonderful city. I grew up in Inwood, which is very Dominican and Puerto Rican neighborhood, mostly Dominican, I'd say. And I grew up there, surrounded by people who looked like me to an extent, surrounded by people who spoke the language and spoke the culture. I grew up living with my grandfather, who's Dominican, and taken care of by my Puerto Rican grandmother. So it was very much an immersive experience. I will note, which will probably come into later, racially, my my mother's family looks white and my dad's family does not. And so... In a weird way, that's kind of how I ascribed how all Dominicans look this way, which, as you know, as you grow up, you realize that's not true. And growing up in Inwood, it helps you a lot to see Dominicans of all shades and colors and what they kind of look like. I was homeschooled, which is weird, I think, for a New York kid to be homeschooled. But it was actually cheaper for my mom, who was a teacher, to homeschool me than it was to send me to private school, which says a lot about New York private schools. And so I was homeschooled. So I went to like every museum in New York. We visited all types of neighborhoods. It was a really great experience. And that led to me going to my first school, like real school experience at 14 for high school, which was at Dominican Academy on the Upper East Side. It was an all-girl Catholic school. I was one of two girls who was, one girl was Dominican 100%. She grew up in Washington Heights and me, and I think that was it for my whole grade. There was only 65 of us, so it was a small, but it was a, it was kind of an introduction to what being in a majority white environment was like. Then I went to Columbia for college and then law school and Basically, from 14 to 22, during this entire time, I worked for the Miranda family and for various businesses that they had. They were family friends, and I worked for them. And then after that, I worked at Goldman Sachs. So I worked for like a Latino family and then transitioned after college to 
the most corporate environment you can think of. Then I went to law school. Then I went to Devil Voice, which is where I've been for the past seven, eight years. So many, many different environments, many different experiences, even comparing college to law school. Even though I was in the same institution, it was very, very different. I want to backtrack into your work experience. You touched on your experience within the Latinx community. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So I mentioned it briefly that I worked with the Miranda family from like 14 to 22. And so they owned a newspaper, they owned a political consulting group, then their son, Lee Manuel, like had a production company. And so I worked for them, like in various capacities. When I was in the newspaper, I was writing columns, I was like 14 years old, stopping people in the street to get opinion polls, you know, then when I was in college, I was working at the political consulting group, fundraising for Dominican politicians all over New York, like Ivanis and Adriano Espaillat and, you know, all over Washington Heights and Inwood in the Bronx, which is a great experience because you get to see like what community work is like. Mind you, I'm working with people who look like me on issues that our communities care about, speaking Spanish, speaking English, kind of using all those skill sets. Then I was working for Lee Manuel, and that was the first time when I started in working and interacting with people who were not Latino. He actually is the reason I even knew what a corporate lawyer was, because when I started working for him, he didn't have, I think, anything going on necessarily. He was writing a musical, and then he got his first musical on Broadway, which was in the Heights. And he had all types of agents who were all lawyers, which I didn't know that, but most agents are actually corporate lawyers. So he had an agent for Broadway. He had an agent for his music. He had an agent for acting. Like it was very interesting. And I kind of got to experience those. It was interesting though, because I was doing it all from a lens of working for Latino people and furthering their interests. And then that very abruptly changed when I went to work at Goldman Sachs. That was a huge majority white environment where it had different, completely different challenges, I would say, than the previous environment I'd been in. This is so interesting. I feel like we've talked about this so many times, and every time we talk about it, I learn something different or think about something different. Like here, hearing you talk about your background in this way, even you know your work with the Miranda family, it sounds like so much of what you were doing and the environment you were learning in was community-based. And it comes from like, even even if you think about your homeschooling, that whole experience came from an internal perspective, the origin family unit, putting that out there. So your ability to create community and create belonging is not surprising to me, given this, oh. given that you're like, your foundation is in community, of course, you know what it looks like and feels like. You're right. Everything was coming from this family orientation. Like I was literally working for a family for a long period of time who were family friends to me. And Luis Miranda helped get my father elected as a judge, you know, when I was a child. These are people I'd know we'd spent holidays together, like a long time. That's always been my approach. I started in this environment of I worked with people who treated me like family because we were family. And they knew me, I think, interestingly, which I realized later on when I worked in environments that weren't like this, that they knew me as a person. They gave me the benefit right. of the doubt. They knew I was a good kid. They trusted me inherently. And they knew me as a person, not as just another worker. They knew me as a person. They'd seen me grow up. Uh, I remember when I, I think I turned 21 when Lee Manuel had his 30th birthday or something. And like, he was like getting me drinks all night, making jokes because he was like, I remember when you were a baby. Like, I can't believe you you can drink now. And so that was the environment I was in. And then when I went to Goldman Sachs, I realized nobody knows me. Nobody There's no inherent community there. Nobody knows my background. It was a very jarring experience. And what I ended up doing was trying to create family. Like you said, you you try to create family, create community, because that's what you know brings out the best in you Right. uh, when you feel that kind of comfort. And this, this goes into so much of our philosophy for this office and for our initiatives is it's all community based. We can't have candid conversations. We can't have the hard conversations unless we trust each other, unless we know each other. And in order to trust and know each other, there has to be a sense of community, right? doesn't mean that you like everyone. doesn't mean that you love everyone. But there is this power that comes from people who come together for whatever the end goal is and say, you know what? We're in this together. Let's take care of each other. Let's take care of each other and let's get to the end of this. Let's do this together. And that for me, and it sounds like for you, honestly, is the hardest part about corporate environments. 
especially like white American corporate environments where it is very like at arm's length relationships. You don't bring your whole self. It's not part of the the culture. Whereas like anytime I've been in my community with my people, you bring your whole self. You talk about your family, you talk about your kids, you check in on each other. If someone is sick, you call them. If, if there's someone passes in the family, you see what you can do. But that is a big difference, I think, in like the standard white American corporate situation. Um, Absolutely. So this all makes so much sense. Zila, you, you are shedding a lot of light. <laughs> I, I think also to your very good point. It, it tends to be one or the other, right? Like, okay, well, I was in this environment where everyone was treated like family. And so we were family and you go the extra mile for family. You wake up at six in the morning and pick up their kids and drive, you know, like you do whatever it takes because they're family. And in the corporate environment, it wasn't like that at all. It was very much, we are here from nine to five or nine to six, whatever the hours are, and we're doing what we need to do. And then the people I saw going the extra mile were people who were looking for a promotion, were looking and seeking some type of affirmation, whether it's a raise, whether it's something else is very much externally motivated. And so I feel like at Deva Voice, I found a mixture of both, which is I want to do right by my team. We're very like community oriented in my group. Like I'm trying to do that work, but also there are boundaries. Like we are not a family, <laughs> which is kind of the con of, of creating too much belonging in that sense where it's like, no, we're not a family. We have boundaries. This is my job. And I have a real family. And to your point, Tanya, hopefully, you know what's going on in my life. And we can check in with that's each other. As people. Right. But there's still boundaries. And I feel yeah, like and that, that's the important that part. Is boundaries, the important. for sure. Absolutely. And I think that's what people don't get about belonging. Like, uh, there's been times where we talk about belonging and people are like, well, we don't need people to bring all all of themselves to work. And it's like, okay, fine. I hear that. But they should be able to if they wanted to, right? We don't I need also, them to, right? Well, you don't but, need them to, but I think if you want people to do their best work, you do need them to. Exactly. And, and maybe that's a controversial opinion, but I actually think that you do your best work when you can be your whole self. Exactly. And, I 100% and agree. Because, for example, I've had instances where a mid, like I have a junior associate and we talked about it. I knew when she got pregnant, we talked about when she was going to have a kid, we hel I helped her plan out her maternity leave because I'd done it. Like I've done mm -hmm. it twice now. I know that if I had not done that, she would have been fine. She would have done it all on her own. She would have figured it out. That would have been fine for her. But I think she would have had maybe a harder time transitioning her work. She wouldn't have had a plan in place and the whole team would have suffered, right? Because she yeah. didn't feel like there was someone she could talk to through that. So I feel like that's the type of stuff where it's like, sure, it can be fine if people don't bring their whole self or share what's going on in their lives. We can absolutely get things done. But are you going to be the most efficient? Probably not. Are you going to be able to fill those gaps when people go through things? Are you going to say, hey, this person was an amazing worker and all of a sudden they started missing meetings and missing deadlines? Like, could it be something going on in their personal life? You know, if you want to let them go, why not try to say what's going on? How can we get you back to being the best employee you can be? And I think that's where people miss the boat. It's very hard to create a relationship out of thin air. Mm -hmm. So if that person didn't feel like they belong, it's very hard to come in out of nowhere and say, well, now there's a problem. Let's be friends. And you, exactly. let me help you through this. Like, it doesn't <laughs> yeah, really I'm work. Become best that. friends in crisis. Correct. You know? So I just want to bring it back. Your experience growing up working with the Miranda family from 14 into your early 20s. Do you think that gave you a, some type of perspective of what affinity groups are, you know, just working in a tight knit community like that? It's so funny that you say that because I actually think it almost made me not appreciate what affinity groups were. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So when I, I was working for them all through college, like mm -hmm. I said. In college, when I started there, there were affinity groups for the first time. There were never affinity groups in high school. I graduated with a class of like 65. There was, there was no affinity group. There were two of us. When I went to college, I was in the minority. There were other Latino kids from all over the country. There were very few from New York. And so I go to college and there's Puerto Rican affinity group, a Dominican affinity group, South American affinity group, a Mexican affinity group. There were all these affinity groups. And I remember going to the meetings and be like, they're being so extra. Like, why are these people so obsessed with finding each other? Like, I have a thousand Dominican friends. I'm still in New York. I'm from New York. I have a bunch of friends. Like, I don't get the purpose of this affinity group. 
there were also Latino and Latina sororities and fraternities. And I didn't understand the purpose of that either. I was like, what are these people doing? Now, looking back, I see that they were seeking community. They were trying to create community. And a lot of them had never been in an environment with as many Latinos, which is scary to think. Like, there weren't that many of us. But this was their first experience as being young adults. And they were like, we found each other, like, rah, rah. Like, we're going to speak Spanish, even if the people around us don't speak Spanish. And I was like, that's just being rude. Like, I was so confused because I, to your point, I'd grown up in this Latino fishbowl. Like, I couldn't imagine needing to seek community in that way because that wasn't my experience. I was still working in an environment of Latinos. I would, for Latinos, you know, like it, it just, I didn't see the value of it, to be honest. So in college, I didn't really participate in affinity groups. It wasn't until I got to law school that I, I kind of got it. It clicked for me. I had a very similar experience in undergrad. And I wasn't in New York. I went to Yale. So I was in Connecticut. But I had grown up in environments where I was in many ways part of the majority. My community was very Black and Latinx. The schools I went to were very Black and Latinx. So I never had to think about being a minority in that way in those spaces. I think outside of those spaces, for sure. But then when I went to Yale, kind of I think you used this word last time, you felt like there was like a performance by some of these folks. And that's exactly how I described them. Like, why are these people performing their Latinidad? And it really turned me off. And I didn't really participate until my, like my last couple of years of college, especially my senior year, where I became a counselor who worked with Latinx freshmen and helping them transition into the university. When I think back at that time, I think about it so differently now. It was so much compassion and so much, you know, that's you can uh, see what the performance yeah. was trying to get. Like, I, I totally get I'm it, telling yeah. you, for example, one of my best friends from college, who's still one of my best friends, Oscar, he was from New Mexico, from a tiny town. I mean, a tiny town. He was half Mexican, one of the only people in his town who was Mexican because it happened to be like a whiter town. And he always felt like he didn't belong because he was half white, half Mexican. Everyone there was one or the other. And we met in college and I just could not relate to his experience at all. He and I both kind of felt like an outsider a bit in the affinity groups in college. But then I met a couple of girls who were in the affinity groups and their experiences were like so isolated. They were like, we're so excited to have found each other. We're so excited to be here with each other. We just want to kind of experience this together and that's where I felt where I was reading it I'm like I don't understand why you're performing your Latina like why are we like being so extra about it Mm -hmm. at every turn but it's because they were just seeking community like they they just just wanted to find each other so badly and I see that so clearly now I did not at the time no same same it's one of those things where I'm like man I wish I had figured out this part of it earlier but you know we're all in our own bubbles when we're all figuring th- the world out outside of our bubbles for the first time, many of exactly. us. So, you know, we just have to be a little bit forgiving of ourselves even. But to any of those people out there who I once judged, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were right. I was wrong. It's really lonely. Out there. <laughs> it's funny that I grew up on Long Island and I had a very different experience. I was never in the majority. I was always in the minority. And when I went to college, we didn't have affinity groups because I was in the minority there too. But it's hearing these stories of like performance. It's it's, it's funny to me to see the different perspectives of it. You know, I always find it a little ironic that I'm a Latina from Long Island, but like Billy Joel's my favorite. So I have Billy Joel and El- Elvis Crespo is like both of them are like love them. I love you that. Have girl. That's okay. You have layers. I will tell you, there is, it's really bad because I was homeschooled. Like, I really was in a Latino vacuum. I cannot emphasize this enough, guys. Like, I had such, I have such like a pop culture gap. Like, anything that happened before I was 14, like, I know nothing. I knew novelas. That's what my abuela put on the TV. Like, I knew nothing. It was like, you thought I lived on another planet. And so many of my friends, my husband teases me. He's like, are you even American? Like, what's going on? Like, how do you not know these, like, basic tenets of childhood and I was like I know that wasn't my childhood like it just shows you like we were growing up miles from each other and I had no idea who Billy Joel was until I went to like college like, which is pretty bad like <laughs> I'm from the town where he's from so like in in elementary school we learn <laughs> we didn't start the fire it's like part of that's like as curriculum I love that. so funny <laughs> that is really funny One of the other things, though, just reflecting on your experience and 
you know, talking about your bubble of Latini that. Because I feel like in some ways I was in a bubble too. It was a little bit more mixed. It wasn't just Latinx. I, like I said, it's Latinx and, and Black folk mostly. However, I feel like your bubble was empowering, right? Like you're, you saw oh. folks who looked and sound and came from the same background as you and you saw them as heroes. You saw them as judges. You saw them as exactly. entrepreneurs, right? And I feel like in my experience, don't get me wrong, I feel like my the people, the actors in my education definitely try to counteract the master narrative and all the things that mainstream media puts out there about various marginalized groups, which are often negative and things that we internalize and have to like think about and unlearn. And I feel like I got a mix of that, right? Because there's everything I was seeing everywhere else and how people like me were depicted and people in my neighborhood were depicted and things like that. But I had these teachers who still took the time to like talk to us about the system, about the master narrative, about slavery and about all these things that create marginalization. But it wasn't, if I had to really be honest, it wasn't that there was always this positive outlook on what it meant to be where I'm from. It was always something I had to kind of fight for and think about and challenge and be critical of, especially when there's constant messages that are negative. And I had to like take a step back and be like, wait, not going to believe this. This is the master narrative talking, <laughs> you know, and like not do it, even from a young age. But it's interesting to see that for you, that probably wasn't as much. No, of oh my a- gosh, I'm getting emotional. I don't want to cry. It didn't occur to me at all, to be honest. And I think I give that as a huge testament to my parents, honestly, because it literally did not occur to me that I couldn't be whatever I wanted to be. Amazing. Like my whole life, because my both my parents, and I think that shows you what one generation can do, right? Like both my parents came from poverty. They both came from, to an extent, uneducated parents. Like my dad's parents had like a sixth grade education, maybe less. They worked in factories. They came over and immigrated. And my dad, I mean, to be honest, the only reason he got an education initially was because he could play baseball. And so teachers were like, we want him on the baseball team. You got to tutor this kid because he doesn't speak a lick of English. And so they held him back a year for eligibility. Like, I mean, all of this was because he could play baseball. And I grew up with two parents who were smart. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a a lawyer and a judge. I mean, I was surrounded by Latinos who were doing everything. Like I had cousins who maybe they were taxi drivers, but I also had cousins who were running the finances of an automobile shop. Like You know what I mean? Like I saw the complexities and the potential of our community. I knew every politician. We knew people who were doing incredible things. So it just never occurred to me that my heritage or where it came from could hold me back at all. I will say, though, I also grew up, my dad went to Columbia. Columbia was like this icon for him. It was the thing that got him out of the hood. It was the thing that transformed his life. It exposed him to culture. It exposed him to so many things. I mean, he's a trustee at Columbia to this day. We are a Columbia family. That's where I met my husband. We run, like we bleed blue, so to speak. But I will never forget at orientation, like I had heard my dad was a baseball star. So his experience as an athlete and in terms of belonging, like he went to Columbia when there wasn't much diversity, but he was also an athlete. So he was on the cover of like the paper every week. Like he was a superstar and his experience was very different than mine. Like when I went, I knew that I knew I wasn't an athlete. I knew it was going to be different, but I was also going as a legacy, which like when you think of a legacy, you probably don't think of me, but I remember at orientation, there's a legacy brunch. And so we went to the legacy brunch. And it was maybe the whitest room I had ever been in to that point. I mean, it was just a bunch of really rich white people. That's what it felt like. And I remember being like, what are we doing here? (laughs) Like, My dad and I are talking. And I mean, we had every right to be there, right? Like, I am a legacy. My dad went here. I'm going to this school. I remember that was one of the first times when I felt very deeply like I don't belong here. And I remember doubting, like, did I just go here because my dad went here? Like, maybe I shouldn't have gone to this college. Maybe like I had real doubts. That first year was hard. I think it was also hard because I didn't live on campus. So I didn't get immersed in the same way. I just stayed home. So I was like, I'm not living in these like terrible little dorms. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm going to stay home. Like, and it was hard. I will tell you, it was hard. And it took me time to find. I think that's one reason I also leaned more into my community because it was hard to be in this new environment where every time I talked to like the other Latino students, they were the first in their generation. Like they were the first to make it out. I was not. And I didn't feel like I was overcoming certain barriers in the same way. I just wasn't. 
And I felt very almost an imposter syndrome in those environments where I'm like, they're all talking about how hard it is in just to talk to their parents. Like literally, like my parents can't help me at all. I don't know what to do. And I was sitting here like my parents helped me with everything. Like my parents helped me with homework. They're paying for college. Like I didn't have any loans out of college because my parents made sure they saved their whole lives to put me through there. I remember, which Tanya, you will appreciate this. I remember I felt like very much like imposter syndrome in both environments. Like I am not of the legacy, uh, traditional legacy of this is like rich wealth. My family is fifth generation Colombians, you know, but I also didn't feel like I was part of the Latinos I met. And so I just invited everyone home with me. That's, very, like, that's very on brand for you. I know. I was going to say this is on brand. Because I was like, you know, I feel I don't feel comfortable. So what can I do? I think we should all get to know each other better. Everyone We're all like, going to be part of this community. We're going to be family like, now. Everyone's going to come home with me. And everyone, like, I had a friend who was from Mexico. And she was like, I miss, like, Latino food. I was like, girl, let's go up to the Heights. Let's go up to Inwood. Come on through. I adopt everyone. And that was my approach. And to your point, that's like what happens. You create community wherever you go. And that's a little bit of what I did. I know we're going to talk about it at the law school because this is a perfect transition. This is my, now you've heard about my college experience. I go to Goldman. I went to law school. And in law school, I knew myself a lot better. I was older. I was kind of prepared for that environment. I went into law school with very clear goals. Like I knew I want to go do banking regulatory work. I loved my job at Goldman. I'm going to go do banking regulatory work at a law firm. There are only a handful of law firms that even have the practice of what I want to do. Like I was very focused, but I also knew I was corporate and I knew like grades matter more for litigation than for corporate. I'm going to spend time doing what I want, which is focusing on the academic things that matter to me and and the community that I'm at. So I immediately go to the Latino affinity group and The Latino affinity group was just like very, I don't want to say underdeveloped, but I think that's the best way to describe it. It was underdeveloped compared to the black affinity group. Those were interestingly very distinct categories, which in undergrad, I don't know about your experience, they were distinct affinity groups. So we kind of all knew each other and we all got together and we threw like big blowout parties of like students of color, you know, like there was student of color gatherings all the time. And I feel like in the law school, that was not the case. It was very much segregated when yeah. I was coming in. I, I have to say, Zila, it was one of the most surprising things to me about law school and firm affinity groups. Like, remember, I grew up in a black and brown community. I was singing the black national anthem before I knew the national anthem because my school was 80% black. Yeah. In my whole life, my camaraderie and my community had always been in the Black community as well as the Latinx community. So going yeah. into college, and I remember like when I would see the Black affinity group and stuff, and I would like you know try to try to go in because I'm like, oh, those are my future potential friends. And then we were just so different because most of the folks were at least middle class, but most were very rich, frankly. Most were legacies, and we had nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> we had nothing in common so i was just like oh my god if the people who i'm used to forming community with are nothing like me it was it was a very weird experience but the same same in law school and in in the law firm like i always expected more camaraderie and more collaboration and eventually i will say we got there in in both places but it definitely took folks making the effort and and before i hadn't had to make that effort yeah, I hear you 100%. I know you've spoken with Lisette and Lisette like ended up working. She's a good friend from ours of ours from law school. And she ended up doing a lot more work with the Black Affinity Group because they were more organized and they just put people to work and had clear, distinct roles. And I think the Latino Affinity Group, one, had not existed as, as long, was not as institutionalized and didn't have, from my understanding, comparable no- numbers in terms of students. So as these things go, diversity means different things generationally. And I think back in the day, there was a time when, you know, being black was the diversity. And then they said, well, being Latino matters too. And then, you know, they just start adding categories that matter. And so, for example, my dad, when he was at the law school, he was one of two Latino students the whole year. And then when I started at the law school, he was like, there's like more than 30 of you. 
what is going he was like this is an overwhelming amount like he's like oh my god they're taking over i was like well they're also more students bad but yeah like, they're, like you know he was but i remember being like this is kind of small compared to college because college is like thousands of students the law school felt tiny so it was almost yeah. weirder to me Big that they time. were so segregated because i was like i literally could know every brown person in this building columbia is not one of the bigger law schools it's not like harvard or something like that where you have I think of what is it like over 500 students a year? Like we don't have that many students. So in theory, you could know everybody. And so the fact that they didn't was kind of shocking to me. And I think when I was a second year and we got positions, I was social chair, shockingly. And one of my best yeah, friends, shock, shocker there. one of my best friends, Wyatt, was the social chair of Balsa, which is the Black Affinity Group. And we just decided that we were going to throw a million events together. We were like, we're best friends and we always hang out and have a good time. So we're just going to throw a bunch of events together and pull resources. And so obviously there were distinctions in terms of like panels and things that the communities needed. But when we were throwing a party, we were like, why would we not do it together? And I hope some of that attitude has continued on because in terms of leveraging affinity groups, that's one of the most powerful things you can do is like, you can stand alone in your own strength and in your own voice. But when you get a bunch of affinity groups together saying the same thing and supporting each other, that's even more powerful. That's how you get things done. And so much of what you want to unite on is actually affecting all of you. Like you have the same <laughs> common goals, 100%. right? And it's just like get together. Before we get into more of what you did at Lalsa, and I want you to, I want you to get into the details. I need to stop right now and we need to give you your flowers because I have to tell you something. No, we do. We do, Zilla. We have to give you your flowers because I will tell you, I benefited so much from the work that you did because by the time I went into CLS, there was a fully formed Latinx affinity group, Lausa. It ha you had raised a ton of money. There was programming. There was mentorship. There was opportunities for us to get help and support. And unlike you, right, I'm first generation everything. I didn't have my parents. The, all the stereotypes people may have believed about you are true about me. So I really <laughs> appreciated having that support. And that's to you. That's thanks to you. And I and the reason why I really want to take the time and give you your flowers is because you didn't have to do that, Zila. You were going to be fine no matter what. You have the network, you have the family, you have the support. You could have gone on your merry way and have a great career and educational background without thinking about anyone else, but you didn't do that. And you're one of the people who opens the door and holds it open and pulls people in. And you're like, no, you're coming in here. If you like it or not, you're coming in here. And so you deserve that credit. And I want to thank you because we need more people thank like you. Thank you. Don't make me emotional, Tanya. I've already almost cried on this podcast, okay? Like, I will say every time I would think of programming, to be fair, the affinity group was majority people with your background, like you were saying. Like most people were first generation lawyers, were first gen college even. They were breaking barriers and changing things for their family. Like this is like real generational purses like being worked through. I found that there were gaps, frankly, in the way the affinity group was run, but also in the way we thought about skills that just were things I grew up with. Like, for example, um, you mentioned money. When we came in, we were 10K in debt. We had no money. And we had a gala that was going to be thrown. And we were like, well, how are we going to pay for a gala to raise money if we are literally in debt? And so we raised, I think we raised 50K that first gala. And that was purely based on me and another friend of mine kind of sitting down with like, how are we going to do this? And I knew this because when I was working for the Miranda family, I raised money for politicians. I was like, this is how you do it. Like, this is how you raise money. I had that skill set. I was like, here we call our friends. Like, we're going to hope we're going to throw it at Columbia's club because they're Columbia affiliated. They're going to give us a disc. You know, like, here's what we're going to do. Now let's map out every like Lalsa alum and what firms they're at and get them to ask them their firms for money because they'll get a response. You ask people who know people like it was just like things that were super obvious to me that I guess are not intuitive if you haven't done that. Like fundraising is not something everyone knows is born knowing how to do. But of course, you know, 18 year old Zila was cold calling. I think the other thing to your very good point was skills about like networking. Like I am so blessed that I was born with a network because of my dad, right? Like he's a lawyer. 
I grew up knowing tons of lawyers in all types of fields. One of my dad's best friends from college was someone at Goldman who got me the interview to even get that job, right? Like that's the type of stuff that doesn't happen a lot for people who look like us. And I think that if my dad had had me in law school, how much easier would his life have been? Because you grow up hearing these stories from your parents, right? And for me, my parents were like the struggles that I, I think my dad's stories sound a lot like yours. I didn't know what I was doing. I was the only person here. Like it was so hard. I was overwhelmed. I felt like I didn't belong, like all of these things. And I didn't feel that way. And I was like, what can I do to change their experience? Because it's like helping my dad, you know, like it's like, what would he have needed when he was going through that? And you can not open the door. You can choose to not do that. And you can look out for yourself. But I think you're going to find that you're very lonely at the top. And maybe you made it through and no one else is going to make it through with you. And guess what? It doesn't matter what your background is. When I was in those interviews, people were making the same assumptions about me that they made about you. And they weren't true. You can choose to not lean into your identity. You can choose to deny it. You can choose to ignore it. I think you're going to end up facing it at some point. <laughs> There's oh, no hot takes. Hot takes. <laughs> I mean, I will never forget. I was in an interview for a law firm when we were doing EIP and someone said like, wow, your resume, you've worked so much. You must have really needed to work to help your family. And I was like, well, I guess. Like, I didn't know where he was like, I, I don't even know what that means. He was like, yeah, you really worked so hard, like to put food on the table. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I was like, like, no, that was Tanya. Let me send you her resume. I I just got a job. I was like, okay. And then he's like, yeah, because, you know, like your parents must be so proud because you're like the first in your family to go to college and law school. I was like, well, they are proud, but no. And it was just so awkward because like, how do you correct people on these things? And you're, you're better about that stuff than me. Like you'll just correct people. I feel really bad. I have that like people pleaser in me that doesn't want to. No, I get it. It's it's a hard thing to do, but I have found... It is necessary yeah. <laughs> to, to clarify those things. Well, you can't let it stand. I, I had to find ways to do that. Yeah, because it's, it's like in these interviews, I didn't because I was like, I'm never going to see you again. But if, you, if you're going to see these people, you have to find a way to correct them. Like letting them know my name is Zila, not Zyla. You know, you, you got to do it. You got to make the correct. I agree. You absolutely have to. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you revived or, or took them to the next level. I know you mentioned you were the social chair. Were there any other nuggets of wisdom that you had from that time? So I think the biggest changes were raising money, like I talked about, raising money so that we could do programming. And one of the things we did was Balsa was always doing retreats. Like they would go away for a weekend somewhere. And I was like, well, we can't afford to do that. But my parents have a house in the Poconos. So what if I just invite everyone to my family's house and we have our own retreat? Which we did, I think, two or three years in a row. Before. I was definitely there. I was there once, at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, like, I think we did it two, maybe three years before. Like, I was like, okay, you guys, like, there are too many of you. you you're breaking my family's house. Like, you need to, like, and also at this point, you've raised enough money you can afford to, like, pay for somewhere to go. But that was kind of step one about, like, you know, literally creating a physical space for all of us to get away from campus, get together, get to know each other, and to also get to know each other intergenerationally. It's very easy to know one class. Like, for example, it's very easy if you are a first year to know the second years because they're the presidents of everything. They're in charge of everything. It's very hard as a first year to get to know a third year. You're not going to have classes with them. Third years are kind of no notorious for not being around. <laughs> you know, like, I was going to say absent. A, right, <laughs> not not <present>. there. <laughs> so I think creating space for people to meet and to bond was important. Like you have to actually be conscious about creating that space. Like I remember I would do so much personal outreach for every social event to make sure that the third years were there. And there are people like Miguel, bless his heart, who was the former president the, when I was a first year, who is like, walking community like he shows up for everything but I can't say that's true for everyone and they did their time right people people by the time third year rolled around you know people tend to dip out a bit and so I was like no 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 we're gonna go rally the troops like we're all gonna be there for the first year and I think that those kind of touch points creating like one mentoring programs we would match everybody up so that everybody had a mentor that existed before we did but we also created more check-ins because accountability is important, right? Like you match people up and then you never see what happens. Like you have to create accountability checkpoints. You have to create different types of programming. Like I mentioned, like 
programming on networking, programming on financial literacy. Like my boyfriend at the time, then fiance, now husband, came in and did a bunch of financial literacy courses because he was a financial planner. And he comes from a background where he's he grew up in Philly. He's black from Philly. And he grew up without kind of any financial literacy, knew nothing about money, and then went to college, degree in econ, went to work in finance. And he was like, we should all know this. He's like, I remember he was shocked at how easy it was for me to get in debt for law school. He's like, is no one explaining to you what these loans mean? Do you know what your repayment's going to look like? Do you understand like, if you're going public interest, like how you're going to pay back these loans, like you're getting into a quarter million dollars worth of debt. Has no one talked to you about this? And I was like, no, I just had to sign this thing one time. And all of a sudden, you know, Columbia gets their money and I'm in school. And he was like, okay, you guys need to have a plan when you're graduating. And I was like, maybe you should just come. And so he came and did a bunch of trainings for Balsa and Lalsa. What our student loans mean, how we're going to repay them practically. Like so many people were like, I'm just going to work at a law firm for two years and pay back my loans. And he's like, really? Let's break down what your month, like what payments you have to be. Let's break down what rent is in New York. Let's break down like how you're going to live and do that. And I think people soon realize that a lot of the assumptions they made were wrong. So like, I think that's part of it too, in terms of building out the affinity groups and creating that space is like, meeting needs that you know are there, but maybe aren't traditionally addressed. The asset of the community is such an important asset because bringing all these people together who would kind of be on their own in the classroom setting, like in the classroom setting, we're just a handful, right? Even in the larger classrooms where there's like over 100 people, you could look around and you know exactly who the people of color are. You can see them. You stand Mm -hmm. out. And you know who who the Latinx people are, who who you know every, every group, right? There's just so few of us. We face a lot of the same issues. You know, I I remember a point in my three years where things being said and done that were just completely inappropriate and affected specifically marginalized groups. And we came together and talked about it and wrote letters and spoke to to the law school and to the administrators and to the professors. How would we have done that without each other? Right. Yep. Like you don't have the support of a community, of a group. It's really hard to do it on your own. It's really hard. It's not impossible. I don't want to make it sound like it's impossible, but it's much harder. The risks are greater and the consequences are greater if you are a sole voice. And so there's so much strength that comes from having a community to stand by you and say, hey, yeah, that's true. That's how I experienced it, too. Well, see, I think that that's that's the key right there. The consequences and the risks are so much higher on your own. Because if I'm saying this happened to me, it's very easy for people to dismiss me as a person and say, well, Zila, that happened to you. But like, this isn't a racist institution or this professor isn't this or, you know, this partner at this firm isn't that, you know, like this would never happen. But when you get a group of people who've all had similar experiences and you're all standing together, suddenly this is an issue that needs to be addressed and not just dismissed. That kind of power and community is what affinity groups are naturally built for. So that's like, you know, obviously there's the benefit of creating community and creating belonging within that community. And then the affinity group kind of serves that purpose. But the affinity group can also empower you. It gives you a clear view and a clear avenue by which to speak. Because for example, if I'm coming and raising issues, I'm Zila. If I'm coming as president of LALSA to say, my community thinks this, it's like a politician. What empowers them? The fact that they represent a bunch of people who voted for them. That's what empowers these politicians with that title and that, you know, that kind of literal power because they have a, they're standing on behalf of thousands or, you know, dozens of people. And to your earlier point, that is a lot of what the affinity group serves at the law firm too. I was just going to say, this is a great transition into the law firm world because we both are builders of affinity groups in that setting. And I will tell you that in my new role, I've learned so much more about how affinity groups work or don't work in other places. And so I would love to get into that conversation because I I 100% agree. There's a lot of things that are similar about the affinity groups you find in law school versus the firm or the organizations that, you know, lawyers work in. But there are some major differences that are important for people to understand that I think we haven't talked about yet. So I'm going to I'm going to throw it back to you, Zeland. Let us know. Tell us about the law firm setting. I will say this. I think law school and law firm affinity groups have more in common than, say, 
law school and college. I think there's something particular about the law. There's something particular about the way people think, the traditions, how mired in tradition the law is. That's something that translates from law school to law firms. Dare I say mired in institutionalized racism. (laughs) That too, that too. I think we should talk about the ways in which there are best practices maybe across affinity groups. No matter what law firm you're in, there are things that just should be. And then I think there are lots of things that don't work if you're not in the right environment. So for example, Deba Voice is a lockstep firm. It's one of the only firms that is left that is super lockstep to the partnership from the partnership, like at every level, we are lockstep. And that lends itself to a certain amount of camaraderie. It also lends itself to a certain type of decision making process. At other firms, you know, where things are not lockstep, you need one person's approval to get something done, right? Like you just need to go to this person and they're in charge of events you can hold at the firm. You just need to get their approval and move it forward. At Devil Voice, there's a committee for everything. And there's a lot more of consensus building that needs to go to move anything forward. That said, the firm is also very progressive. So it's like, they're on your side, but even to get things done, you kind of need to build consensus. And that's how everything happens at the firm. So that's like a very cultural specific way to get things done. So I can say it is like a cultural truth, like every affinity group should be having events. In order to ha- to be an affinity group, you can't just be a listserv, which I know some law firms, their affinity groups are just listservs. Oh, girl, say, call it out. <laughs> call so like it, it needs out. to be more than a listserv. It also needs, frankly, to be more than a recruiting device where it's like, more oh, than we a welcoming have- committee. Right. If like your two we events have- are welcome summers and welcome first years, you are not an affinity group. You heard it here right. first. You need to be having events, right? So I think that's a universal truth. In order to have a real functioning affinity group, you need to be having events on a regular basis to, like we talked about with the retreat and all these other things, create community, create space for community to be built and to exist and for people to feel belonging. You know, you need to have those spaces. So I think how that gets done, whether that's having a weekly snack break or whether that's having a monthly lunch or what like it doesn't really matter how it gets done every firm and culture is different like for example at Deba Voice we are spread very far I would say our diversity numbers are significantly better than average but we're still the minority by a lot and we're spread out so you say we have 50 Latinos in corporate we also have like a dozen groups right so there's no 50 M&A lawyers right there's like a handful here a handful there so creating that community is important. So like you said, we know each other and we know who each other is. And I think networking is such a bad word and people don't like to talk about it, but networking is just knowing people. And Tanya makes everyone, all my friends make fun of me because they know like Zila has a person for everybody. And I really do. But it's because like you bother to get to know people. You're a master networker. That's a uh, girl. I want to be you when I grow up. I'm, <laughs> older than you. I'm positive. I'm older. Than you, but I still want to be you when I grow up. Because, yeah. and you're right, and it's the part of this job that I love so much, that my job is just to get to know people and connect them. It's amazing. It's also like networking, to me, networking is just building relationships and building community. And mm-hmm. I don't need to get anything out of it. And I think that's the thing, that people are like, well, I'm not going to bother to get to know this person because they're not going to hire me for a job. I'm like, what? That's like, that is not, like, it's, yeah. it's short-sighted, <laughs> but it's also so wildly transactional. Like, yeah. The best way to build community is to do just that, like build a community of people you know. I can't tell you the number of people I have gotten calls about in my time at the firm. Like I have all my friends who went to clerk, every friend who's been up for a federal job, they have to get background checks. Like the number of times I've gotten calls from judges because they know my dad and are like, hey, so-and-so is applying for a clerkship. I see that they would have been at Columbia at the time Zila was there. What does she think of them? What was their reputation? They don't even ask me if I knew them. They're like, what was their reputation? Like, what had you heard of this person? Which is wild if you think about it, but that's the way the world works. I so, mean, that, that's just real. I mean, <laughs> that's just what it is. People vet, each, vet people. That's exactly. our job <laughs> in many ways. And the legal community is small. It is. And I cannot express that enough. Like, I could probably name, like, almost every Latino partner in New York, right? Like, at a major firm. There aren't that many. They made two Latinas partners at my firm recently, like over the past few years. And I am so thrilled. Like, I couldn't be more thrilled. I love them so much. And there's a Latina Cravath. We all know who she is. Like, there's a, you know, like, we know who these people are. There aren't that many of them. Yeah. 
and they're doing the work for the community. But I think to an extent, you need to do the work for them too. Yeah. One of the things I know, like this is something I'll mention because one of the people they made a partner at Double Voice is Sally Bergman. She is a partner in our funds practice and she used to run the affinity group back in the day. And then it transitioned a few times and then it transitioned to me. And one of the things that I think so is so important that she has not been leading the affinity group for years. And that's the way it should be. I don't think you should be having people who are first years running an affinity group. And you shouldn't have people who are like six, seventh years running an affinity group. The sweet spot is mid-levels. They know just enough to know the firm, know the culture, have some judgment. They also, this is a great way for them to get exposure and meet partners and work with people they normally wouldn't. When you're a senior associate, like, chances are you're either going to be up for partner or you're looking to leave. And so a lot of knowledge could leave with you. Like you don't need the exposure, you know, the partners already, you know, like, I feel like the value in the position is not there the way it is for mid levels. And so in my opinion, like mid levels are the sweet spot. Yeah, I I, I think I tend to agree with that. I think the only caveat I would say is when we say who should be leading, I think that role, I mean, we could have a whole podcast, a separate podcast on this. It still assumes that the organization is supportive. What I That's find true. is that regardless what year you're in, the onus of doing the work falls completely on the people who need the affinity group the most, right? And the people who are being bogged down with all the emotional labor of seeing their peers struggle, trying to get them to buy in, trying to get yourself to buy in creating space for all the things and still communicating outside. That is a lot. A lot of us are doing this work for free on Mm -hmm. top of all the other things we need to do as associates. And that's where I would say, so the caveat is, yes, if if I had to say what is the best position of someone who should be leading the affinity group and kind of facilitating the conversations in a private setting, I would say it's a mid-level, but that person should have all the support in the world, should not be having to create things from scratch, right? And this is also assuming that the firm or the organization is supportive, which it sounds like you have been very lucky to have that. But you know, I will tell you, I have heard and seen really hard things where affinity groups kind of work against the, the office, the DEI office, because they aren't collaborative. You know, I've heard of affinity groups being squashed and, and, and stomped out by the DEI office at firms, which you I've never heard that expect well. that. I've, yeah. I've seen it, you know, like where they're like, nope, or only allow well, for I certain affinity that, groups. I, I think that's also, that's kind of a, a complicated topic, I think, at a lot of firms. But it holds true for law school as well, which is yeah. what role does a DEI office play at your firm? And that's a little bit of what I was touching on before, which is what is your firm environment like? Because if your DEI office is not there to be an ally, but instead is there to basically calm down any uprisings by the associates, that's a very different role, right? They're just basically there as a tool of the partners to kind of check in with associates, as opposed to being an ally and saying, what are the issues? How can we come alongside you to deal with them and also help you communicate them and get in front of the right partners to get that done? Which I will say, like, very grateful that that's what our DA, like DEI office has been. Like an ally kind of helping us navigate when we want to get something done. And also support us and say, okay, you want to get this done. Like, here's the budget. Here's what we're working with. We should talk to these partners because they're interested in this. You know, like, I, I will say also, I've been very lucky because my law firm just recently named a partner who I'm very close with as the managing partner. And he has been the host of the Latino affinity group for years. Like he used to be the partner who would take us out karaoke after, (laughs) after Latino affinity groups. But like, it's just like the whole direction of the firm. I am just like, I couldn't be happier, honestly, but I know like, I won't, I won't quote too much because I know how bad it can be at other firms because I was a first year with my friends. We were all in, like not all of us, but a lot of us were in big law. And I remember calling people and people saying like, I don't know what to do. I have this issue. And I was like, well, just call your, like, you know, the mid-level, whatever. And they're like, there are no mid-levels. Like, there are none left. Yeah. I'm like, what do you yep, mean? Yep, yep. We hear you know, girl. Like, it's, girl. I've se- so I've seen a lot of things. I've heard of it through a lot of my friends. And frankly, I'll be honest with you. 
if I did not have such a supportive environment, I probably wouldn't still be at a law firm. Ding, right? Ding, ding, that's why people leave by in droves, right? Absolutely. When you're, when you're like, why are all the, all the people of color leaving by the time they're third year? Because there isn't community. Because they don't feel safe. And because to your great point, like, listen, when I went to Deba Boys, it was not my first time in corporate, right? I'd gone mm-hmm. to Goldman. Very few people have corporate experience before they go to a law firm. I'd also been working since I was 14. So a lot of people, this is their first job. Like you, I know you didn't have this experience, but there are a lot of people who go straight through. So if, imagine, imagine a law firm, which is like the most white shoe environment, super corporate, super conservative by all means, you know, like what kind of all measures, even the most liberal law firms are still pretty conservative environments. Yeah, for sure. Imagine that's your first job. <laughs> it's Girl, it was not my like, first job, and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, which is saying a lot. I've had a pretty traumatic life. <laughs> and I will tell you, being in that it was very, very And I, I will tell you, I think, I mean, it's so hard. And I think one of the things that I know we talked about a lot when you were first starting out is the difference in language. You're like, oh people goodness. are telling me this, but I don't know what they really mean. And I was like, no, girl, what they're saying is this. Like, when they said this could be improved, they meant you really F that up and you need mm-hmm. to never do that again. And it's like, you know, and like, that's not, that translation is not coming across. And that is a role that affinity groups can play because the number of times I have spoken, I remember one of the first issues I brought to our DEI director was that I felt like I was consistently hearing from associates of color that they were surprised in their annual reviews. Like shocked. Like they had never gotten this feedback before. And I wasn't seeing that in my white peers. Like yeah. they, whatever they were getting, whether it was positive or negative, their reviews were not a surprise to them. And mm-hmm. my review was not a surprise to me. So I was like, something is getting lost in translation. Yeah. Because they're getting feedback, but they're not hearing it or something's not translating. And the first time you hear something should never be in your annual review. Like oh my nothing God, say it in louder for the people in the back, for the partners who didn't hear it. The first time should not be in the review. <laughs> right. Like you should have been getting this feedback all along. And Devil Voice is known for kind of having this very collegial environment. And we have had so many initiatives, which like bless Nicole Massard. She's another like partner who's now the deputy presiding partner who she's like has a million initiatives about feedback and giving feedback and giving informal feedback and giving feedback like at the end of a deal and in the beginning, in the middle of a deal, like, you know, like all of these initiatives, because it's important. Mm -hmm. It's important. And I think the people who are hurt the most by it are women and people of color. Oh, for sure. Because they're not, you know, like it's already difficult to work across difference, let alone give negative feedback across difference. Like I, I remember there were some partners who didn't want to tell me like what I was like, no, just tell me, trust me. I'm not like, I'm not soft, like, I won't cry. I'm not, and even if I did, like, tell me what's good. I want to know. I want to improve. And there's one partner who teases me every time. He's like, I'm giving you feedback because I know you love feedback so much. Because I used to ask so much. And I told him, I was like, yeah, I do. Because you know what? I'd rather you tell me than find out. And I'm like getting downgraded or, you know, some negative review. And I had no idea. I mean, communication is key, right? (laughs) And being able to speak candidly is key. And in my experience, the only way you could really have those kinds of candid relationships and candid conversations is when you've gotten to know each other. Absolutely. And when you know what the limits are. If you're walking on eggshells or scared to say the wrong thing, who is benefiting? Right? So, yeah, I 100% agree. So we've talked a lot about affinity groups. So do you have any last thoughts about the values in affinity groups? I think affinity groups hold a ton of value for their members, but also for the institutions they're a part of. When people feel like they belong, they have loyalty, they perform better, they uh, are better citizens of that organization, they do more, they participate more, and basically everything they do. So I think having an affinity group will help law firm specifically, because that's, you know, the environment I'm most familiar with, with retention, with getting the most out of their associates, with building bridges with their associates, even learning how to better give feedback and get the most out of their associates and their performance. And for associates, it creates a sense of community, it creates belonging, it gives them mentors, it gives them an environment where they can feel hopefully more at ease, more themselves, and honestly, bridge the gap 
into helping them feel like members of the community at large. Like maybe the first year you don't feel comfortable at the annual dinner. And then by your third or fourth year, you know, so many people, it's like your own, you know, your own brochure. You're like, oh, this is my party. Like, I love this event. And you probably didn't feel that way your first year. You probably felt a little out of place and nervous. And so I think that affinity groups can cut the time in half, at least, that it takes for someone to feel at home at an institution. So I think that's the real value. If you are interested in getting involved in an affinity group, I think you should talk to as many people as possible before you do it. I would say that because it is one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I really enjoyed it, but it's a lot of time. And it is not something that I could ever walk into a review and say, oh, well, I build like 500 hours to community development and this affinity group. So I did 500 less billable. You know, like that's not really how it works. It's usually work you're doing on top of your billable work. And I'm happy to do it because frankly, it's benefited me so much more than I feel like I've done anything for anyone else. But you, that's because that's something I love to do. I'm an extrovert. It's a huge outlet for me. I feel like I have a lot of skills and things I want to pass on to others that come naturally. But if you are someone who's an introvert, if you are already overwhelmed at the firm, getting involved with the affinity group might be the best thing you've ever done. But it also might be another thing that's on your list that overwhelms you and makes you feel like you're now disappointing your peers, right? Like, so I have seen people get involved and get overwhelmed. So I think you need to take a hard look at where you are and what you're willing to do and what your time commitments are like. And then I would also say, be very clear about why you're going into getting more involved with an affinity group. Because I have seen, I mean, I have luckily had this like charmed experience at Devil Boys, it seems, where, you know, a lot of what I was doing was community building and having a great time. And yes, issues have arisen that we've addressed within the firm and gotten action on, but it was already in this environment of mutual respect and camaraderie. And like we had the members, the management committee asking us for meetings. Like, can we meet with the leaders of the affinity groups? We want to get this right. I know that's not the case at a lot of firms. I know at a lot of firms, you take on this leadership role and you are sometimes in opposition to the leadership of a firm, which can make it very difficult if what you want is to be a partner. Let's be honest. So I think you have to be very clear about the firm you're in, the environment you're in, what you're willing to do and what you're willing to risk, I think, to Tanya's earlier point. No, then this is a great lead into our final question, which I'm going to, I'm actually going to add an answer for you. <laughs> <and then> you <laughs> yes, the rest. Because I think we want you to think about what support systems do affinity groups need? And I, I'm saying I'm going to add something because I think the advice you gave for people who want to join is absolutely right. In, in the state of the world and the way that these firms work, I think that's 100% right. And it's why we don't see the kind of participation in the affinity group that we would hope to in all places, right? Because it can be a huge burden. It's a lot of time. You don't get paid for it. It's not acknowledged. In some places, it could literally hurt your chances of becoming a partner because you're seen as like a union rep or part of the union, which is, again, so such a perverse way to think about affinity groups. But it's also for those of you out there looking for firms, look and see which partners were actually parts of affinity groups. And if if people who participate in affinity groups, if they make it to partnership, that will tell you a lot about these spaces. But one of the things I would add is Give people the acknowledgement that they deserve for taking on this work. It shouldn't be a burden. It shouldn't be that they have to do this on top of what it means to be associate. If you ha- if you are lucky enough to have one of these unicorns, like Zila, at your <laughs> firm doing this work, compensate her for that. Make a certain number of hours dedicated to that. Or pay people extra. There's so many ways you can compensate people for their work and not make this yet another burden on folks and you know there's so much research Forbes had research on this recently how DEI work in corporate spaces is now like yet another emotional and labor intensive work for mostly women of color no surprise there so anyway we want to hear from you what other support systems do you think affinity groups need and then that'll be it thank you I think in terms of support I think there are probably three ways I would think about support for affinity groups specifically in law firms one is just financial support like do you have a budget do you have a way to get things paid because I'm I've talked about having events and attending conferences like the Hispanic National Bar Association conference is I think is happening right now like can your firm send you 
who would you go to to get that paid? How would you participate? Maybe you want to participate, like the Hispanic National Bar Association has a Latina Academy, like, you know, the Latina Commission, where you do like all types of executive coaching and, you know, all types of training. Like there's all these opportunities. I mean, the New York City Bar has scholars and things you can be nominated for. Like what is, like, where is the money? Like what is the kind of structure and process for a budget? And then I would say, I would also say, Number two is probably logistical support. Like, are you going to be having to negotiate contracts for venues? Are you going to have to be like, what are you going to have to be doing on the ground to actually plan an event? Are there event people at the firm that you can just hand off and say, we want an event on this day, like find me three bars and like, tell me what the pricing is. Like, like what amount of logistical support can you have? Can you enroll your assistants in that work? Can you enroll a staff attorney, an events planner, like whatever it is. I feel like, that's the type of work that takes so much time and is so not rewarding, but it takes so much time and someone's got to do it. So if you have support that you can hand off, like that is, I feel like that's incredible support. And then the last type of support I would say is kind of this kind of institutional support. Are you, is the firm behind you? Do you have regular meetings with management? Do you have regular meetings with partners? Are they supporting your initiatives? Are they checking in with you? Like, What's what are those avenues? Because there there are firms that will throw a ton of money at an affinity group. And I have friends who have led affinity groups at those firms. And they're just kind of like operating essentially like an independent organization within a firm. Like they never meet with partners. The partners have no idea what's going on, but they give them an annual budget and like kind of let them do what they do, which is fabulous. That's like that's not the worst thing. But that doesn't mean that when something happens to a group of affinity members and they need to go to management at that firm to figure out what, what how are we going to do this? Like, we need to do something about this. Crickets. They have no idea. They have no connections to management. They have no connections to the leadership of that firm. There are no avenues for them to pursue change or to kind of, you know, pursue any type of advocacy work. And so not that every affinity group has to be about advocacy, but I can tell you, if you've been in it long enough, it will come up. Not every year, maybe not even every two years, but it will come up. Something will happen and and things will need to be addressed. And and that's okay, right? And And in an ideal world, an affinity group is the perfect space for that to happen because there's built-in trust and there's built-in community. Every family has issues. Exactly. That's how we deal with it. (laughs) I mean, you would hope that people could, I, I will tell you, you would hope that you would have a family who would address those issues and come together and figure it out and not just sweep it under the rug. Because I have seen that too. I've seen affinity groups where senior associates are just like trying to discourage the more junior associates from raising issues. And now that I'm the senior associate, I try so hard not to be that person. This has been so great. Thank you so much for imparting all this knowledge on us and on folks. I know this is not going to be the last we hear of you, but thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Building Belonging, a podcast of the New York City Bar Association and its Office for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the City Bar. Find more City Bar podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher, or at our website at www.nycbar.org slash podcasts. This podcast was produced and edited by Eli Cohen.